Uh, good afternoon. My name is Paul Wax. I'm the Executive Director of the American College of Medical Toxicology, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar series entitled Medical and Public Health Considerations of COVID-19. Uh, this webinar is a special collaboration between uh, ACMT and the uh, PESU uh, uh, network, and it's part of a mini-series on safer disinfectant use in COVID-19. Uh, today, we will be having a webinar entitled Disinfectant Sterilization, a primer with focus on use in healthcare facilities. Next slide. I'd like to uh, thank our webinar series partners for helping to disseminate uh, the information about this program. And I'd like to particularly thank uh, uh, the PACU program and the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, for getting the word out about today's uh, special webinar. Next slide. Uh, as mentioned, uh, this webinar is the uh, first uh, in a series of webinars over the next few months about uh, safer disinfectant use. Uh, this um, is a, a project uh, which is supported uh, by uh, ATSDR uh, and uh, through the American Academy of Pediatrics and the PACU program. Uh, we thought that this uh, Top here was of particular importance, and we will having uh, we will be having a series of webinars on this topic uh, over over the next several months uh, with uh, further information to come. Next slide. Um, as mentioned, uh, this webinar was supported by the American Academy of Pediatrics and funded in part by the cooperative agreement uh, with the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, ATSDR. Next slide. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the end of the webinar. Uh, most of our webinars have a, a quite a, a robust uh, Q&A session for uh, 15 to 20 minutes or so at times. And, and so I, I urge you to uh, think about uh, good questions and please uh, type them into either the Q&A function uh, or the chat box. Uh, and we'll get to as many of the questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also have a series of uh, COVID-19 web series uh, FAQs on the uh, COVID website. Uh, next slide. Uh, we recently had a webinar on influenza testing and, and a series of questions uh, uh, were addressed at that time. And you can see these questions up on our, on our website. And we have a series of questions on, on many of our webinars uh, as some additional uh, resources. Next slide. I'd like to thank my uh, co-moderator, Dr. Ziad Kazi. Dr. Kazi is a board member of the American College of Medical Toxicology and president of the Middle East and North African Clinical Toxicology Association as associate professor of emergency medicine and medical toxicology at Emory University. Uh, Dr. Kazi will be helping out with the Q&A uh, toward the end of the session. Next slide. Uh, it is really my, my pleasure uh, to uh, introduce our, our plenary speaker for today. Uh, we really have a world-renowned expert uh, on, on both disinfectants and also on, on uh, uh, viruses and uh, uh, COVID-19 specifically. Uh, Dr. Uh, David Weber is a distinguished professor of medicine and pediatrics and epidemiology at the University of North Carolina. Uh, he wears uh, many hats, in, including being the associate chief medical officer and medical director of hospital epidemiology at UNC. And uh, he's going to bring to us today uh, his uh, wonderful uh, world of, of knowledge about disinfectant use, particularly as, a, as it pertains to healthcare uh, uh, facilities. Uh, he'll be addressing uh, some COVID-related issues toward the end of his talk. And for those of you who are listening, this is really the intro talk uh, to a series of, of, of uh, sessions about webinar about disinfectants. And we hope to bring Dr. Weber back in the future as well uh, for some uh, further uh, for some further uh, training. So at this point, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Dr. Weber. You know, thank you very much. Yeah, Dr. Weber, you're on mute. You have to unmute yourself. There. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, very good. Good. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, asking me to provide this talk. It's a great pleasure uh, to be with you today. I know this is an important topic, and I really want to thank everyone for taking time out from their uh, busy day to hear this talk on disinfection sterilization, a primer with a focus on use in healthcare facilities uh, there. Much of this talk as I'll uh, show you, is uh, based on the CDC uh, guideline, which was published in 2008, for which uh, Dr. Rutella and myself 
uh, were uh, co-authors. So, and uh, the learning, uh, whoops, sorry, I'll go back one. Learning objectives. Uh, first, my disclosures are here. Uh, none of them are, and I don't uh, mention any specific uh, products that are not in published papers uh, on today's talk. Learning objectives are understand the Spalding classification and its use in selecting disinfectants and sterilization methods in healthcare facilities. Understand the advantages and disadvantages of disinfectant sterilants for use with critical, semi-critical, and non-critical devices and surfaces, and I will define all of those for you. And understand the properties of an ideal uh, disinfectant. Well, this uh, just uh, gives you some demonstration of the problems that uh, we have in uh, in hospitals. This is from Bob Weinstein in Chicago, uh, now uh, almost uh, 30 years old, and it really shows that healthcare-associated uh, infections uh, really are much like uh, an iceberg. Most of them come from the organisms that we have on our body and our skin, uh, and uh, then those organisms gain entry into the patient through surgery, wound infections, vascular access devices, bacteremia, uh, through putting people on breathing machines uh, and getting pneumonia and bladder catheterization and urinary infections. But about 15 or 20% go patient to patient. Uh, and of these, a uh, substantial amount come from colonization or contamination in the environment. And they reach the patients by direct contact with the patient with the environment or through the hands of healthcare providers. Some of the key organisms we're most worried about include uh, MRSA, VRE, Clostridioides, Difficile, Acinetobacter, Carbipenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae, which are uh, Klebsiella, E. coli, and Enterobacter, and, uh, and neurovirus. So E.H. Spalding believed how an object will be disinfected depended on the object's intended use. So it's not based on how the object was actually used, but its intended use. Critical are objects which enter normal sterile tissue or the vascular system or through which blood flows, and they should be sterile. And we'll talk more about what I mean by sterile in, in a few moments. This would be things as we'll describe like a heart valve or a surgical instrument. Semi-critical objects uh, touch mucous membranes, that is uh, mouth, nose, vagina, rectum, or skin that's not intact, and they require a high-level disinfection process that kills all microorganisms but may not eliminate high numbers of bacterial spores. And non-critical objects touch only intact skin, and they require a low-level disinfection. Now, this uh, scheme has been revised over the years to include such things as prions, but we're not going to go into those uh, top, that topic uh, today. We can talk about that at, a, at another uh, meeting. With that, uh, let me uh, go ahead and talk about the uh, microbiology uh, diversity, uh, disinfection hierarchy. So the easiest to inactivate are envelope viruses, uh, then bacteria, fungi getting more difficult to inactivate, non-envelope viruses like norovirus, uh, mycobacteria, and the most difficult uh, spores with the exception of uh, prions, which we're not talking about today. I should mention, as we'll talk about later, SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus, so virtually any agent that's listed as a hospital-grade disinfectant and approved by the EPA in the United States would, in fact, inactivate uh, this, uh, uh, this agent. Oh, let me go back one more. Yeah, sorry. So I just want to point out to you uh, that uh, high-level disinfection, as I'll point out in a minute, uh, will inactivate everything on this list. So this is the guideline for disinfection sterilization, which in the United States forms the basis uh, for much of what I'm talking about and for guidelines in the U.S. Uh, we are currently revising this guideline. It'll be brought out as a multi-society guideline this time, sponsored by the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America and the Infectious Disease Society uh, of America, rather than a CDC guideline. All right, so critical devices, they enter sterile tissue. Contact is direct. There, of course, are our surgical instruments. The control measure is uh, sterilization. There is an enormous margin of safety. Uh, very, very rare outbreaks uh, with uh, uh, sterility issues uh, there. In fact, we've studied, by the way, surgical instruments in general. Uh, they uh, have less than 100 microbes. 
to be a sterilizing procedure, you have to eliminate 10 to the 6 of the most resistant organism placed in the most inaccessible part of the sterilizer uh, to that specific sterilization method. And you need to have to do that in half the time uh, that the normal cycle time would be. So you're getting 10 to the 12th uh, in activation. And this, as you can see, is well over anything that we find on these type of items. So sterilization kills 1 trillion spores. Now, again, sterilants, by definition, uh, is, uh, will remove all life forms. So this is absolute, unlike other forms of disinfection. When I talk about a sterilizing procedure, that is the complete elimination of all viable organisms, including spores. Prions are a little different category. I'm not sure we would consider them viable, uh, but it is true some of the sterilization procedures, timing and the way we would use them, unless modified, would not completely inactivate uh, uh, prions. Fortunately, uh, they're a very uncommon source of, uh, of disease. So what are the methods we use? Steam sterilization. Steam sterilization is the most robust method. Uh, it uh, uh, kills uh, 100 quadrillion, huge margin of safety. I should say, by the way, cleaning is important. It re removes uh, 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 4 organisms. And we, cleaning must always precede uh, disinfection. And then we have a variety of other techniques, uh, so-called low temperature techniques for items that uh, can't withstand the temperature of steam hydrogen peroxide gas plasma, ethylene oxide, ozone hydrogen peroxide, and vaporized hydrogen peroxide uh, uh, there. But again, steam is the most robust method uh, that we, uh, we have. And in fact, there really are uh, at most, uh, certainly less than a handful of reported uh, problems with steam uh, sterilization leading to infection. And when we do see problems, it's because uh, uh, of uh, human error, not steam sterilization. People putting something into a steam sterilizer, uh, leaving somebody else seeing a tray in the steam sterilizer, removing it, not realizing it was not properly uh, sterilized. Now, items must be cleaned using water with detergents or enzymatic cleaners before processing. Cleaning reduces the bio burden, removes foreign material, organic residue, and organic salts that increase, interfere with sterilization processes. You should do it as soon as possible after the item has been used. You don't want that uh, dried, uh, on the on the item, and in the absence of cleaning, most low temperature sterilization methods can be shown uh, to fail. But steam is so robust; even if you didn't clean it, the steam will penetrate, and it is uh, really the most uh, robust method uh, there. So, how do we do the cleaning? Mechanical cleaning, machine automated uh, equipment certainly increases productivity improves uh, cleaning effectiveness and decreases worker exposure. So most of us use automated cleaning methods. Uh, you can use uh, utensil washer sanitizers, ultrasonic cleaners, washer sterilizers in some cases. If not, just simple dishwashers uh, can be used. And least uh, uh, the one we prefer least is actual manual cleaning, although some very sensitive uh, items or items with small lumens still need manual cleaning. Most places will use manual cleaning initially to get rid of the gross debris, but then we prefer a mechanical uh, cleaning uh, method. This is an example of a uh, mechanical cleaning method. The, you can see the items look quite clean as they're going uh, into that, and they are uh, uh, pre-cleaned, and they go through essentially a very fancy car wash, but much fancier uh, with uh, uh, high-pressure jets and uh, uh, disinfect uh, uh, detergents and enzymatic uh, cleaners to remove uh, protein and other materials. You'll also notice uh, that you have a clean and dirty side in your clean in your uh, uh, sterilization disinfection. You have one side that has dirty objects, and then the other side, which has separate airflow and is removed, has the cleaned objects so that you have a clean to dirty flow with physical separation, both of people, of air, uh, and of devices uh, between the clean and dirty sides of a uh, disinfection sterilization room at a modern medical facility. Now, we do need to monitor everything we do to make sure what we think is being done is being done uh, uh, correctly. We want to detect failures as soon as possible, remove medical devices and failures before uh, patient use. There are a number of ways to do it. 
Uh, one is physical, cycle time, temperature, pressure. Uh, so uh, steam sterilizers, for instance, will usually have a paper tape readout plus alarms uh, to know that they reach the time temperature for the and pressure uh, for the proper times. Those tapes are removed. Uh, everything is barcoded so you can trace back every single instrument to its washer disinfector cycle, uh, to its sterilization disinfector infection, and ultimately to a specific uh, patient. So if there's a, a breach, those are all entered into a book and now they're computerized for that. In addition to that, we have chemical heat or chemical sensitive inks that change color. These are not as precise because all they'll do is change color as soon as you reach uh, temperature and a, uh, or you, they get exposed to the chemical. So they don't actually say that they were in there long enough, but again, it's a recheck and actually this is on the uh, trays that go out. Uh, so in addition to checking everything before they're actually used, the nurses and technicians look at that color and look to make sure uh, at least an indication they've been through a sterilizer. One issue there I'll say, depending upon who makes the chemical tape, they can go from different colors like blue to red or red to blue. So you don't want to get confused because there isn't any standardization in the U.S. for what the color change is. And the second problem is that the color change, we do test all of our people who interpret these. They have to pass a, uh, uh, the ability to uh, see color, as you know, 5 to 15% of men may be colorblind. And so we actually test all of those people using a, a simple colorimetric test uh, scheme that can be displayed on the computer. And then finally, we ultimately check is to actually use spores. And again, you pick the most resistant spore that is put in a sterilizer at every run with an implantable device, in our case every day, but they should be put in at least uh, periodically. Uh, and you want to actually prove that the uh, sterilizer did in fact kill the most resistant spore in the most inaccessible spot in a fully loaded uh, sterilizer. And again, they're bacillus spores, but the specific spore use is dependent on the specific uh, sterilization method. Steam sterilization, again, non-toxic, cycle easy to control and monitor, inexpensive, rapidly microbiocidal, least affected by organic and inorganic soils, penetrates medical packaging, although you need to, your packaging needs to be designed for that, and device lumens. The major problem is deleterious for heat labile instruments, and there is some potential for burns. So if you took an instrument out of a sterilizer uh, and immediately touched it, uh, there could be a burn to the worker. Uh, more importantly, sometimes people use uh, uh, what used to be called rapid sterilization methods, which are uh, 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 call, used to be called flash sterilization, and take a device out and put it directly on a patient if it's not cooled, usually in sterile saline or water. Uh, we have had patients have burns. And you can see the minimum uh, uh, steam sterilization times uh, uh, for at 132 degrees in a pre-vacuum sterilizer uh, for wrapped uh, instruments and textile packs. And then there needs to be a drying time to remove uh, any uh, water vapor since you don't want the wrapping to be uh, to be moist. We used to have time uh, dependent, once something was wrapped, a time dependent period of time before they'd be re-sterilized, 10 days, 30 days. Now we use event determinant, meaning as long as the paper is intact uh, and the uh, packaging has not been damaged, then they don't need to be re-sterilized at any set time. All sterilization processes are effective uh, in killing spores. Cleaning is critical to remove proteins and salts. Failure to clean or ensure exposure to sterilin could affect the effectiveness of sterilization process. So, for instance, if you have a long, narrow lumened uh, pro uh, 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 tube and you don't connect it to the sterilization process, passive flow is not adequate. You need active flow for a low temperature uh, method. All the low temperature technologies have some limitations. There are some of them that are used, ETO, HP gas, plasma, and in the presence of uh, salt and serum, one, they, they can fail. So cleaning uh, is critical. And of course, uh, steam sterilization is the, uh, the best method. Well, let's go on and talk about semi-critical medical devices. Transmission again is direct by touching the patient. This is an example of uh, cleaning. Uh, an endoscope uh, used to look into the bowel. It's high-level disinfected. Endoscopes are the most dangerous medical devices we use in terms of failures of disinfection with more than 130 uh, outbreaks. 
Uh, in the uh, GI endoscopes, there's a zero margin of, uh, of safety, uh, really, uh, because uh, they can have a 10 to the 6, 10 to the 8 uh, uh, pathogens on them. Cleaning removes 10 to the 2, 10 to the 4, and uh, uh, high-level disinfection, by definition, 10 to the 6. So we're right at the margin of safety. This, of course, is many more organisms than we find on surgical instruments. They're complex biofilms, and we'll talk more about that. For other semi-critical devices, antiscopes, endocavity probes, uh, laryngoscopes, cystoscopes, they are much less complex. They have a reduced microbial load, and outbreaks have been uh, very uh, uncommon. So here are some of the, uh, um, at least in the U.S., uh, uh, FDA-approved uh, high-level disinfectants, glutaraldehyde, orthothaldehyde are uh, the most common used, uh, but we also have accelerated hydrogen peroxide, parasitic acid, a variety of hydrogen peroxide uh, combination products. So there are a variety of uh, different uh, high-level disinfectants. You can see they have exposure times from 8 to 45 minutes. Some uh, have temperature requirements, uh, have to be, should be done at high temperature. And of course, as with any other chemical, they need to have uh, both uh, direct contact as well as uh, an appropriate concentration of the chemical. Uh, so the appropriate concentrations obviously uh, need to be monitored and, uh, and validated, as does the exposure time. And again, the difference here for high-level disinfection, it will kill mycobacteria, viruses, envelope, non-envelope, fungi, and bacteria. And it will eliminate uh, a number of spores, but it may not completely eliminate all the spores depending upon uh, the, uh, uh, the load of, uh, of spores. In general, that's not a problem, although uh, we do worry because spores are really uh, human pathogens, but for Clostridioides uh, uh, difficile, that would be some concern found in the GI tract and can contaminate, uh, uh, contaminate uh, endoscopes. Uh, so that would be the one of, uh, of concern. Uh, here is just some uh, nice uh, uh, study that uh, was published a number of years ago, just looking at all the uh, outbreaks, uh, upper GI, sigmoid, ERCP, bronchoscopy totals. This is uh, seven years ago, and the paper stopped its uh, look at the even earlier of the outbreaks. You can see 100 outbreaks. You can see uh, uh, 250 contaminated patients, over 1,000 colonized patients. Up until recently, all of those outbreaks, because Somebody didn't follow the ways of proper sterilization disinfection, didn't clean properly, didn't put the chemicals in properly, didn't have the right conversation, the right time, contaminated them after the uh, disinfection cycle. You can see for uh, bronchoscopes, it's usually pseudomonas and mycobacteria. Uh, for uh, GI, it's often salmonella, uh, H. pylori, and uh, uh, pseudomonas. Now, what's happened uh, more recently, and this is only uh, a summary, more than 25 outbreaks have been described, of usually duodenoscopes, which are also called ERCP scopes, uh, which are the most complex of the endoscopes we use. And this was despite uh, doing everything correct uh, in the cleaning disinfection protocols, following the manufacturer's instructions exactly. And now we've had uh, outbreaks, and I'll tell you a little bit uh, why. These were not realized until we started having problems with multidrug resistant organisms, particularly carby, venom resistant Enterobacteriaceae, because if somebody came back three months later with an E. coli UTI, there was no reason to think they acquired it from uh, uh, an endoscope or they came back with sepsis. But because of these rare organisms, uh, uh, people were able to pick those up, do molecular studies, and link in many cases, multiple patients to a single patient who was the source of this, and in some cases, linking it directly to the organism found in a duodenoscope. So here's why we see them in duodenoscopes. They heat labile uh, so that they can't be steam sterilized. They have long, narrow lumens, so they can be more than a meter long. The lumens can be as small as uh, one millimeter. They have right angle bends uh, here rough pitted surfaces, springs and valves. Uh, when you're cleaning them, you can damage and rip the internal channels, which can lead to biofilm. They're heavily contaminated, 10 to the 7th to the 10th. And uh, 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 cleaning, as we said, can reduce up to six logs, usually around four logs, HLD up to six logs. So essentially, these, uh, there's no margin of safety. You can have as many organisms as the processes you use 
And this is why we see failures uh, of, uh, uh, of high-level disinfection in duodenoscopes. So what is the recommendation? Uh, many of us, including Dr. Rutella, myself, but my professional society, Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, all believe that the FDA needs to move to requiring not disinfection, but sterilization, uh, as many other societies have here listed that too. This gives you a much greater burden of uh, safety, and this could be achieved in a number of ways, a steam st sterilizable uh, 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 scope, uh, one is we're already beginning to use scopes that uh, have disposable parts or a completely disposable scope. Uh, my hospital mostly uses disposable bronchoscopes and disposable endoscopes are just coming on the on the market. Or we need uh, better uh, techniques for performing high-level uh, disinfection. So we do believe to provide patient safety, uh, we need this shift from disinfection to uh, sterilization. And again, talking about the margin of safety here, uh, again, because of the amount of organisms on these and uh, uh, the uh, efficacy of cleaning and high-level disinfection, you're right at the borderline of protecting. But if we move to sterilization, uh, then we have this enormous uh, uh, safety margin of somewhere between 10 to the 4 uh, to 10 to the 6 additional coverage, which would mean we'd rarely, if ever, see an endoscope-related infection. Moving on to non-critical surfaces and medical devices. Uh, these are surfaces in the hospital and medical devices uh, that touch patients, things like blood pressure cuffs, glucometer, glucose monitors, uh, uh, but other things, you know, wheelchairs and others. Transmission can be direct to the patient or secondary by contaminating the hands of healthcare providers. Control measures are appropriate hand hygiene, uh, which could be a waterless alcohol wash or a soap and water. Uh, or soap and a disinfectant, antiseptic, uh, and uh, of the hands uh, before and after touching every patient on devices, and low-level disinfection uh, there. Outbreaks have been uncommon, but some have been reported. Again, most outbreaks are from failure to follow the simple uh, rules that uh, we have for uh, disinfection and for hand hygiene. So uh, let's talk about uh, uh, the contaminated surface. Uh, there, this is from John Otter, a friend uh, who lives in the UK. A contaminated surface uh, there, most common organisms, again, C. difficile, MRSA, VRE, gram-negative organisms, neurovirus, uh, they go from the infected uh, patient. They can go directly to the susceptible patient on the contaminated hands of healthcare providers or indirectly via contaminating a surface. Occasionally, uh, they can go uh, by air, but uh, that's uh, much less uh, common and even less common is direct patient-to-patient -patient contact uh, since we don't have our patients two to a bed, so uh, that's really uncommon. Uh, again, uh, environmental contamination then leads to uh, healthcare-associated infections. Many studies have shown that despite terminal disinfection, when a patient leaves their room, surfaces are often contaminated. These organisms, called epidemiologically important pathogens, can survive days, weeks, and in the case of C. difficile, for months. I'll talk to you more about uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 later on. Then contact results in uh, hand contamination. Disinfection reduces contamination. That then reduces healthcare-associated infections uh, uh, there. So we're going to talk about that. Admission to a room, this has been some of the best evidence uh, that uh, uh, disinfection really is important. Uh, there are a number of studies that have shown that when a patient, I've already told you that rooms can be contaminated in 25%. Some studies show surfaces remain contaminated in 50%. It's not a failure of disinfection, the, that is the disinfectant. It works, a failure to get the disinfectant to touch the surface. So if you're unlucky enough to get admitted to a room where the previous patient had MRSA, VRE, Acinetobacter, C. difficile, Depending on your study, your risk of acquiring that as colonizer infection is anywhere from 40 to 350 percent higher compared to going into a room where the previous patient didn't have one of these pathogens. So you can see the risk for C. difficile in one study uh, was more than uh, more than double. And uh, then if you're colonized, you have an increase of uh, of infection. So how do we interrupt that? Uh, this is uh, from some of our work. So we interrupt it by proper hand hygiene, 
before and after every patient contact and before and after going in the room. But the, that's even been more expanded. The WHO has five ways, five reasons for doing uh, 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 hand hygiene, and we should all follow those. And we interrupt the uh, uh, surface environment contamination by cleaning and disinfection uh, of, uh, of surfaces. So again, low-level disinfection removes envelope viruses, gram-positive bacteria, large non-envelope viruses, vegetative fungi, gram-negative uh, bacilli and uh, fungi. It won't remove uh, spores. It, uh, it has longer terms of activity and, or maybe inactive against non-envelope viruses like norovirus, slowly active against the mycobacteria, and non-active against bacterial spores and prions. Uh, but again, we, we rarely acquire those uh, from, uh, from the environment. And of course, cleaning does physically remove many of those things, even if they're not killed by the disinfectant. Here are just some of the low-level disinfectants we use. Uh, we prefer disinfectants with a one-minute exposure time to killing, uh, which could be just the drying time as well. Uh, older uh, disinfectants are often studied for 10 minutes, but if they evaporate and dry in three minutes, it's not practical to stand there, put a disinfectant on, wait, put a disinfectant on, wait, put a disinfectant on and wait. Chlorine certainly is uh, sporicidal. It's commonly used, uh, it's cheap in much of the world. People object to the odor uh, in some places. Phenolics and iodophores uh, and quaternary ammonium compounds, but really phenolics and quaternary ammonium compounds are the most common used. We have been moving more towards improved hydrogen peroxide because it has an excellent safety profile, and paracetic acid is often used so, uh, for, uh, as a sporicidal agent. So if you're looking, you want to buy a disinfectant, what are you looking for? Broad spectrum, kills everything, fast acting, one minute, remains wet longer than its uh, uh, action time. It works even if you haven't completely cleaned the object non-toxic, so you don't need gloves or masks. And by the way, hydrogen peroxide is the most non-toxic product, but most of the products we use are quite safe and well-tolerated. Surface compatibility shouldn't damage the instruments. That's probably the most sensitive thing we have to clean off or uh, screens like I'm uh, looking at right now. Uh, certain chemicals won't work on them. Ideally, persistence so that it, uh, unlike alcohol, doesn't just evaporate and the bacteria grow back and ease of use uh, for the uh, environmental service workers. Others are acceptable odor, economic, soluble, and good cleaning uh, capacity. And there is no such thing as an ideal disinfectant, but many of our disinfectants are doing just an excellent job these days. Justification for using a disinfectant for non-critical surfaces is if you just uh, use soap and water, uh, even with good cleaning, uh, one of the problems is all you do is contaminate your mop or your washcloth. If you take that mop or washcloth and go from room A to room B or patient space A to patient space B, all you're going to do is spread the organism from one place to another. Uh, so uh, in the United States, we always use a disinfectant. Some other countries have concerns about disinfectants uh, uh, causing respiratory problems or skin problems. We have not seen that. I was uh, medical director of occupational health here for 28 years. We rarely, if ever, uh, saw those problems. So we do believe uh, that disinfectants are necessary, not just uh, physical uh, cleaning. They also are more effective in reducing contamination. I'm going to show you some data in a minute uh, 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 there. And they're particularly important for patients who have uh, colonized or infected with a multi-drug resistant uh, organism. So uh, it's practice, not product. In the U.S., the products that we have licensed to work, uh, like some products may not be licensed to kill uh, spores. So if you're concerned about C. difficile uh, or norovirus, non-envelope virus, you certainly want to make sure you use uh, an appropriate uh, product. Uh, but here you can see uh, we use the disinfectant. We use the spray and a wipe, a saturated cloth, a spray, wipe, spray, a spray, just alone without any wiping. Uh, there, and they all work with more than four log uh, uh, reduction. You can see with the detergent, in which case was actually wiping with the detergent, you got substantially less. So again, the disinfectant has to have uh, contact uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the contaminated surface, but doesn't really matter how you get the disinfectant uh, onto the surface. Uh, obviously, if you're using a wipe, you're getting some physical cleaning uh, as, uh, as well. 
but if you have the right disinfectant, you don't need it. I want to point out to you here the importance of having the right disinfectant, though. Uh, this was uh, for C. difficile, which is a spore former, a variety of products on the left. If you're interested in the actual chemical names, they're all in the paper. And at the top, the different, again, the different ways we did this for C. difficile. On the right, you can see we just sprayed and air dried, so there's no physical removal. And those two products uh, are not active against spores. You can see uh, when you just used a cloth uh, or you sprayed and wiped or you sprayed, wiped and sprayed, and you were doing wiping, you were actually getting physical removal. Uh, but if you were just spraying it on and leaving it, uh, it didn't work because it had no direct uh, uh, killing uh, capability. So again, now imagine that you weren't using any disinfectant. If you were wiping and carrying it from room to room, you're just uh, uh, trans, uh, transmitting it uh, uh, there. Uh, but if you have the right chemicals, uh, then uh, even if you're uh, not uh, physically removing it, uh, the chemical will work. And you can see the 1 to 10 bleach had almost a four log in activation just with spraying and air drying. So the right disinfectant is, uh, is critical. Now, all touchable surfaces uh, should be uh, uh, disinfected. If you look at the literature, they often talk about high touch surfaces. There's no standard definition of a high touch surface. I'm gonna to talk to you about it, we can define it but a touchable surface. So you don't really need to worry in the hospital about what's happening on your ceiling and, and high levels on the walls. Yes, you don't want them physically dirty uh, and you do want them cleaned periodically, but they don't have to be cleaned every day or necessarily between patients. Everything that's touchable by a patient or a healthcare provider does need to be touched, uh, does need to be uh, disinfected. So here uh, was a study of ours uh, and you can see uh, we stood there uh, surreptitiously and watch what people touched in the ICU and the non-ICU and uh, bed rails. Uh, patients always have their hands on there, very commonly touched. Uh, things like a light switch, just touched a couple times a day. So yes, you can define high touch surfaces. They're a little different between the ICU and non-ICU. So yes, you can define that. But when you look at contamination uh, here, two studies, the first one done by uh, our group and the uh, another study down uh, below, you would find that the number of organisms in a high touch and a low touch surface are, uh, are similar. So if you actually count organisms, uh, uh, the colony forming units for those organisms, it doesn't matter whether it's a high or low touch surface, they're contaminated. And that's why we don't believe uh, that we should be just disinfecting high touch surfaces. We ought to be disinfecting all the touchable surfaces. Now, people will ask, okay, uh, so what? We, if we, uh, 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 what do we know about the, uh, I already told you about the risks of going into a room, but what about cleaning? Does that really make a difference? Well, there are a number of studies, uh, and this study has now been published, actually, it says in press, there's one from Dr. Salgado on the right, that demonstrate as the level of contamination goes up in the room, the level of healthcare associated infections goes up in the room. And I'll give you data a little uh, while showing that improved cleaning and disinfection actually reduce infections. So uh, uh, the bottom line is patients contaminate the environment. Uh, and if uh, the more contaminated the environment, the higher the risk of, uh, of infections. Yep. Okay. So what do you what do we all need to do? Standardize your sterile your uh, sterilization disinfection or cleaning disinfection of rooms throughout the hospital. All touch surfaces wipe with the disinfection daily when spills occur and when visibly soiled. All non-critical medical devices that are shared between patients disinfected daily when soiled. Uh, clean disinfect sink and toilet. Damp mop the floor with the disinfectant. Uh, if disinfectants are prepared as opposed to already used, uh, use the proper concentration. Most of us use wipes. They're easy. They're uh, uh, pre-made uh, there rather than having to mix things up uh, ourselves these days, although it is acceptable to mix up your own disinfectants. So follow best practices for room cleaning and disinfection. You can find those on the CDC website or in any of our, uh, uh, our guidelines. People need to be trained. We train our environmental service workers uh, at onset of employment and at least once a year. I should have mentioned this with high level disinfection and sterilization disinfection, st 
sterilization. We train all of our workers once a year. They get a refresher four hour course uh, 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 they, uh, at, uh, well, at least once a year. And they have to be physically observed to make sure they're doing it right uh, by their supervisors. So that is critical. You need checklists to make sure everything's getting cleaned and disinfected in rooms. One of the problems is uh, uh, AVS workers don't like touching sensitive equipment like patient monitors because if they hit the wrong button, they're worried that somehow or uh, a, a machine that's delivering drugs to a patient, they could harm the patient. So usually the nurses do that. But unless it's absolutely clear what the nurse cleans and what the environmental service uh, worker cleans, then sometimes nothing's getting cleaned, that device, because everyone thinks someone else is doing it. So those checklists need to be there. They need to be updated. And they need to be specific because what's done in a neonatal intensive care unit is different than what's done in the emergency room. Uh, and it's different than what's done in a medical intensive care unit. You should assure proper cleaning. Doesn't measure disinfection with fluorescent dye or ATP. We prefer, prefer fluorescent dye. And ideally for uh, significant uh, pathogens, we believe you should follow your chemical disinfection uh, with a means of a no-touch system for terminal disinfection. I'll talk more about that later. And we do that at my hospital. How do you tell if something's clean visually? Not very good. You could culture it, but it's not immediate and really uh, doesn't, uh, 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 doesn't work except for research. You can use ATP bioluminescence, but there is no validated cutoff. So there's no uh, a study that or a guideline that says, if you're under X, you have a lower risk of infections and the area should be clean. And because you're not actually measuring uh, bacteria, you can put down a large number of bacteria and still have a negative bioluminescence and you could have all dead bacteria and have a positive bioluminescence. We like the fluorescent system, easy to use, demonstrated to improve cleaning and demonstrated to reduce healthcare associated infections. A little invisible dot is put down. I don't have a picture. You use a black light, you can see it. The supervisor goes in, dots different objects in the room, varied so the worker doesn't know where. After it's clean, they go in and look for the dot. It's physical removal, it's a measure of cleaning, not a measure of disinfection. We do this routinely in about 5% of our rooms. We monitor it, we give feedback uh, to our uh, environmental service workers, although we don't prefer the term feedback. It's a little pejorative, we use the term just in time coaching. And we uh, look at that every month at our infection control meeting. Uh, here is just a whole, this was a nice uh, outbreak by Kurt Donsky a number of years ago, but in any case, even seven years ago, he looked at a whole series of uh, studies that uh, demonstrated that improved cleaning and disinfection, reduced, uh, eliminated outbreaks or reduced uh, patient colonization or infection. And you can see, if you look down the list, outbreak ended, decreased VRE, decreased acquisition MRSA, outbreak ended, et cetera. So there's no question that there's substantial evidence that improved cleaning and surface disinfection reduces healthcare associated infections, which is our real goal. That said, there's no magic bullet. So here is a very nice study, again, coming out of Dr. Donsky's group looking at C. difficile. They used fluorescent markers, and that improved cleaning. Uh, then they used a UV irradiation for terminal disinfection. And then they used a dedicated disinfection team, and they reduced their colonization, their CDI, a positive culture rate from 67% uh, down to uh, 7% only. So again, no magic bullet. You have to do all these things and do them all uh, correctly. Other important things are curtains, uh, uh, particularly the grab areas we've studied that do become contaminated. You can use a spray that's safe like hydrogen peroxide. Uh, you can uh, use disposable curtains and change them between patients, or you can take them down and launder them, but that's not very practical. We just spray the grab area, the part you grab on the curtains there. Shared patient items, again, another study of, uh, uh, by Dr. Donsky, if not properly cleaned, can transmit multidrug resistant organisms. Again, you can use a standard disinfectant, use fluorescent dots to prove they're cleaned, or you can use something like uh, UV disinfection. Dr. Donsky has studied uh, floors and uh, uh, shown they can be contaminated. They will end up on people's shoes and go room to room. Uh, generally, we don't eat or touch the floors, so it's been somewhat more difficult to show they're the source for risk in the patients. And there is not a, currently a recommendation that floors daily be disinfected, uh, but that, uh, that may come uh, there. 
I would caution you against having fabric uh, anywhere in a hospital room. Everything in a hospital room needs to be disinfectable. You can't uh, uh, disinfect a porous object. Uh, so, uh, and this was shown by uh, uh, Dr. Noski uh, in uh, Noskin, sorry, in uh, Chicago. That patient sitting with those flimsy johnnies uh, uh, could contaminate uh, the uh, chairs with VRE, and then you can't get it out. All of our mattresses, for instance, are covered with impervious plastic, uh, and if those are breached, then we throw the mattress away. So everything in your in a hospital room needs to be cleanable. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about SARS in the last a few minutes. I'll open it up for questions. Transmission uh, is uh, largely uh, by uh, droplet spread, less than six feet. There have been some cases of a little bit uh, longer transmission of uh, aerosols direct uh, contact, people hugging, kissing, et cetera, indirect through uh, contaminated environmental surfaces, although direct is uh, more important, and, uh, but you could touch it, rub your nose or eyes, and it's uh, by inhalation of the non-infected person. People can transmit while symptomatic in the few days before they become symptomatic, and 40% of people are asymptomatic, can transmit uh, as, as well. Rare cases of mother to child, uh, companion animals can become infected, uh, and sometimes there have been deaths among dogs. Uh, animal to human transmission, well described from mink to humans at the moment. Uh, travel related cases, many outbreaks on ships, buses, trains, and others. No evidence of transmission by blood or urine. So, what about environmental survival of uh, uh, this case? It's uh, other coronavirus, but people have shown this with SARS CoV 2 as well. It will survive in the air, but that's a rotating drum, not really relevant here. But to the right, you can see it'll survive on plastic, steel, cardboard uh, for uh, uh, hours and in some cases uh, days. Uh, but so it survives less well on, uh, on paper products than it does on other products. So yes, it can contaminate the environment. Someone who's ill uh, with COVID coughs, sneezes, it'll contaminate the environment. Again, this is SARS-CoV-2. Uh, here we're talking about on actual human skin uh, uh, there. Uh, these were not people. Uh, they'd taken the skin off of cadavers and things. And you can see here on the upper right, it'll survive on skin for hours. Uh, but if you uh, use alcohol, uh, it's rapidly killed. So 80% ethanol. In fact, anywhere between 60 and 90% alcohol uh, will eliminate all the SARS-CoV-2 on a surface or on hands uh, within 15 seconds. So. Yes, it survives, and yes, waterless uh, hand products uh, will uh, eliminate it. Soap and water physically eliminates it uh, as, uh, as well. Surface disinfection, uh, here you can see here, this was a healthcare facility. You can see uh, uh, a couple of rooms on the left, A, uh, where the red spots are where they found uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA doesn't demonstrate necessarily viable virus, but if you don't have any RNA, you don't have any viable virus. You can see it's uh, found uh, across the room, but in room B where they were wiping the uh, area down using a disinfection wipe, you can see it's all green. So yes, disinfection does remove uh, SARS-CoV-2 and uh, would do decrease the risk of healthcare providers in the room getting ill or uh, obviously cleaning the room between patients uh, particularly if the next patient doesn't have SARS-CoV-2, which is why all the guidelines for protecting yourself against uh, SARS-CoV-2 are mask, most important, physical distance, second most important, but also include appropriate hand hygiene and surface disinfection. The new normal in the COVID era, it is endemic now and it will stay here. Roughly only 10% of the U.S. has been infected. Uh, uh, most part, there's no part of the world that's really reached uh, the parts to get so-called community protection herd immunity. Uh, you need 70% infected to get that. So until we have a large number of people immunized, then uh, we will continue to have to do those mitigation methods I, uh, I noted. And maybe even after, we do know that you can get reinfected with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, as many as 50% of people do not plan to take the vaccine because of uh, uh, concerns. So the mitigation strategies I mentioned are the new normal and will be with us uh, for months to come. Uh, so that's all uh, very, uh, very important. And the demand for disinfectants and antiseptics will grow 
as we reopen places like K-12 schools, colleges, restaurants, workplaces, and travel, we will need to use all those mitigation uh, efforts uh, uh, there as, uh, as well. So, and then just end up, uh, the, what we're moving to is even better ways of disinfecting the environment. Uh, one is to use a disinfectant with persistence that doesn't just get rubbed off like quaternary ammonium compounds uh, generally do or evaporate like, uh, like alcohol. And so here was a study we did where uh, we uh, put a disinfectant down, repeatedly rubbed the surface using an automated device, and then put rechallenged that uh, uh, device um, uh, multiple uh, times. And uh, what we showed was uh, that in general, you get excellent log kill uh, after 24 hours with a persistent uh, disinfectant. What about no touch methods? Uh, uh, these can only be used for terminal room disinfection, the current UV devices. Hydrogen peroxide systems are inimical to humans, so there can't be anyone in the room. They have reliable biocide activity. They're good at uh, disinfecting uh, surfaces and equipment. Uh, demonstrated effectiveness in before and after studies for both. Uh, demonstrated effectiveness to reduce healthcare associated, effectiveness, uh, uh, healthcare associated infective infections and randomized trials for UV light. The UV, uh, both are residual free, don't give rise to health and safety concerns uh, after a period of time. Again, only done for terminal disinfection. Everyone has to be out of the room. The UV devices are much faster, even when using them from spores, than the hydrogen peroxide devices. UV does require direct or indirect line of sight, so a bathroom to the side, you have to move the device and do it again. But HP also has its problems. You have to close off uh, the HIVAC system uh, to, to do that. There are substantial capital equipment costs, and you still need cleaning. And in the United States, these are widely used uh, in the United States at the present uh, time. Just showing you some of the clinical trials of no-touch disinfection uh, methods uh, uh, there. And just look at the right. Uh, you can see all those arrows pointing down, uh, depending upon what they were measuring, C. difficile infection, all multidrug-resistant pathogens, MRSA, VRE, uh, uh, others. So there are more than a dozen studies. Uh, they looked at different pathogens, but all those uh, studies, and realizing some were before or after not the best design, but when you see such consistency, uh, you have to believe uh, that uh, they really uh, do, uh, do work. And with that, I'll stop, and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Weber. This was a fantastic presentation with a lot of uh, uh, important foundational information uh, although you did uh, have a pessimistic note about uh, the endemic uh, future of, uh, of the SARS-CoV-2, that said, though, it, it seems more important than ever that we are really understand all these issues surrounding uh, sterilization and disinfection. We have a number of questions listed in the chat and Q&A, so I would uh, predict that we are going to go till 4.15 p.m. Eastern, so uh, we appreciate everyone's patience. We want to uh, really um, uh, go through all these questions. The first, uh, I'm going to start with the chat uh, box real quick because that, that's the one that has less questions. Um, and I will start with a question related to the data you provided on these disinfectant, uh, disinfection procedures. Uh, are they also applicable in ambulatory care settings that are being more and more uh, uh, used by patients these days? So certainly in ambulatory surgery settings or procedures, the answer is yes. We have little research in uh, the ambulatory care setting to know uh, where you're, let's say, 15 patients in an exam room uh, over you know, a day, what the risk is of transmission from patient to patient. It's just not been well studied. Yes, I do believe that uh, you, you know, more than pulling the paper down that the patient sat on, it should be disinfected, uh, the things the patient touches uh, there. But there has just been a paucity of research demonstrating uh, how frequent a more a better disinfection needs to be done and what the risks are. But it's really something I agree we need to focus more on. What about schools that use uh, technolo technological equipment for their, uh, for their students? Uh, is there any uh, particular uh, uh, difference there? So again, a very few things have studied uh, 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 issues outside of uh, really healthcare uh, facilities. Chuck Gerber, uh, at Arizona has done a, uh, a great job of studying things like bathrooms on planes and uh, tray tables on planes and others, and they're frequently contaminated. Uh, we have done uh, studies of uh, 
MRSA and uh, gym, gymnasiums, for instance, and 15% of equipment has MRSA on it. So that needs to be uh, looked into. You certainly can feel familiar with MRSA outbreaks on uh, football teams and many other types of sports teams. Uh, but we don't really have a good handle about how many people and you certainly, uh, prior to COVID, been into restaurants where they sort of take a, a dirty hand towel, sort of push all the crumbs aside and then put your plates down. What those type of risks are in, in schools, uh, restaurants, other places, never been well studied uh, uh, there. But uh, I think we're in a new normal with COVID, and I'd like to see that made permanent. Well, you know, one of the uh, things that I enjoy the most is eating at restaurants. And um, I was wondering about you know, the uh, oral transmission, or is there like some sort of the uh, oral transmission of the, or GI transmission of the virus, as well as um, some restaurants, uh, so these are two questions, some restaurants use these ionizing, ionizing systems, they ionize air with some sort of mechanism. Can you comment on those, please, for restaurants? Sure. There, was, there was an outbreak at a restaurant in China. It showed that the people who were downwind from an air conditioner actually got ill a little more than six feet away. Uh, outside of uh, uh, that, none of the people at the other 15 tables became ill, suggesting relatively uh, short transmission. Certainly, if people are uh, infected, even if uh, they're not symptomatic, if they're coughing, sneezing, or even talking, the particles they expel will be infectious. Somebody coming and touching that could rub their nose and become ill. That has been hard to study, but there are uh, believed to be some outbreaks. There are at least two outbreaks, one at a mall and one at an apartment building that were felt to be by a touching uh, elevator buttons. There's one person who acquired disease on a plane, wore their mask the whole time. The source patient didn't sit next to them, but she took her mask off when they used a common lavatory, and there was felt to be transmission there. So there is clearly some evidence of uh, indirect transmission uh, that uh, uh, has been, uh, uh, has been uh, reported. Uh, obviously, uh, I think uh, eating outdoors more than six feet apart is much safer than eating indoors. And even uh, six feet may not be enough, depending upon airflow indoors. Obviously, people are unmasked while eating, which is the best way to protect yourself. So, uh, yes, I have some concerns about eating indoors these days. And those ionization systems for heat and air, does that? Yeah, they're not going to help much. Uh, the problem is, uh, you know, certainly people have looked at UV lights and for, for uh, that or other ways of filtering the air, others. And the answer is they will help over longer distances. But if I'm sitting four feet away from you and I give a good sneeze, there isn't any uh, wall system or ceiling system that's going to interrupt that short distance transmission enough to prevent you from becoming ill. Certainly for diseases like uh, chickenpox, uh, uh, measles, tuberculosis, where there's evidence that if you're in one room, someone in an entirely other room is at risk, uh, those systems are very good. But it has, remains to be proven whether they'll work for preventing COVID. And at least in one place where they found viable SARS-CoV-2 virus 12 feet away from a patient, it actually had filtered air through a UV system uh, that eliminated pathogens and 90% of the air recirculating in that room went through that UV system, and yet they could still find viable SARS-CoV-2 12 feet away. Wow, very interesting. And uh, what about the oral, like the pe people that prepare food that may be infected yeah. and you eat that, you eat that meal? So certainly uh, foodborne illnesses in the U.S., more than 70 million cases a year, which is what we've really focused on from a public health standpoint. There is no evidence that SARS-CoV-2 is spread by water uh, or food. That's been really a blessing, actually. And uh, what about uh, the when you talked about the soap uh, and water efficacy against yeah. this envelope virus? How does it do it? Does it actually uh, destroy the, the envelope virus or does it destroy the virus or bring in the solution? Is there any more details on that? So with soap and water, it's physical removal. It's not destruction of the virus. Uh, of course, if you used an antiseptic in there as well, like uh, chlorhexidine, that would uh, uh, eliminate the virus, but it's physical removal. Very good. Thank and it you. will remove two to three logs. Just, you know, your mother was right. Washing your hands with soap and water works. It does remove two to three logs uh, there. Uh, the uh, uh, antiseptic uh, alcohol works just as well. In most cases, it's more convenient. Again, as with any other disinfectant, the disinfectant has to touch all the surfaces that are contaminated. So the quick just wipe like this, you got to get in between your digits, the back of your hands. You really do need to do your hand hygiene properly. What do you uh, think about the uh, use of these wipes nowadays? Uh, I, I work in the ER on a, on a regular basis, 
And because of the supply issues, so we, we, we cannot put, we use these big buckets of wipes uh, or we even have them in bags. So we don't, I don't necessarily know what the chemical is. I'm assuming it's some sort of chlorine based uh, chemical. Um, should we always recommend using gloves when we are cleaning our stethoscopes or is it okay to just man, handle them uh, directly? Yeah. I think a little depends. Uh, you really, what you need to do is look, first of all, you should only use in any healthcare facility a, a product that's approved by the regulatory agency in your country, in the United States, uh, it would be uh, uh, the EPA. Uh, for hands, it would be the FDA. So you want to use an approved product, and you want to look at that product's label as to whether you do or don't need uh, gloves. Most of us feel comfortable using an alcohol uh, product without gloves uh, because it's an antiseptic as well. Uh, but certain chemicals, uh, you would generally want to have gloves on uh, before you use them. Uh, while uh, chlorine products in general wouldn't be dangerous, they are drying to the skin, and you'd probably want to have gloves on if you were using a chlorine product. Very good, thank you. What about um, one of our uh, participants asked you to comment on the disinfection and reuse of N95 respirators using hydrogen peroxide processes, and if that's uh, if that's effective. So the answer is, uh, uh, ideally, you would not reuse N95 uh, masks. You'd use them for a day appropriately and then discard them at the end of the day. If you had not enough for that, you'd go to an extended use and uh, you can use them for up to five days, uh, properly putting them into uh, a, a bag between uses, making sure you don't contaminate the inside, hand hygiene before and after touching the mask. But if you needed to, then you could go to a disinfection method uh, they're available on the CDC uh, webpage. People have used hydrogen peroxide vapor uh, for that. Other people have used the ultraviolet light has been used for that. Uh, heat doesn't work as well. It often damages it. Uh, you want to make sure that the mask still works, so you need to have people trained in how to do a self-fit test and that the rubber band and you still get a good proper fit. Most people, each time it goes through a cycle, put a little dot somewhere on it, and we usually want it to be used no more than five cycles uh, there. And of course, whatever process you're using needs to have the right concentration, right time, right intensity. And there is data both in the literature and on the uh, CDC webpage about how to do that effectively and safely. And you know, uh, in my experience in the emergency department nowadays, um, Many times I see a patient in the hallway first uh, that has, uh, you know, seemingly unrelated complaint, and then the next day I find out they were uh, COVID positive yeah. or SARS-CoV-2 positive. So and let me I comment on back that. At the hallway, yeah, for the disinfection of these yeah. high traffic areas. So we at my institution and many institutions in the U.S. use what we call universal pandemic precautions, meaning all of us are wearing a mask anywhere outside of a private office anywhere in the hospital. Doesn't matter if we're in a patient room or not, we are masked in the hallways, uh, except while eating, and then we are physically distancing there. In addition, we are now wearing, what is that? With an N95? No, no, just a regular surgical mask, uh, uh, which is adequate. And uh, in addition, uh, we are wearing eye protection anywhere in the hospital as well. Uh, and we do wear an N95 for known COVID patients, suspected COVID patients, and any aerosol generating uh, procedure, we do wear an N95. And we ask all of our patients to wear a mask at all times if they're in the room with a healthcare provider. Of course, young children and some of our patients due to their medical ailment can't wear a mask, but we do ask them to do that as well uh, for maximum protection. We've taken care of more than 700 COVID patients, inpatients, and we've never had transmission from a COVID patient to a healthcare provider. So our techniques are working. But what about the high traffic area, like these hallways where these patients are placed a little bit and, you know, then they move into a room and then they turn out to be uh, infected. Are there any acceptable uh, levels of contamination of emergency department hallways, you know? Well, again, uh, every one of our people in that emergency department would be and in the hallways. We wear the mask everywhere in the hospital, not just in the patient room. Hallways, uh, seeing our going down to x-rays to look at an x-ray, uh, uh, so we are always masked uh, to prevent that exact uh, issue. CDC does define exposure as within six feet for more than 15 minutes over 24 hours. So brief exposure probably has a very low risk, like passing someone in a hallway. But we are masked as soon as we come into the healthcare facility, and we stay masked except when we have to eat or drink uh, till we uh, uh, till we leave. 
Very good. I would like at this point to uh, turn it over to Dr. Wax to uh, look at some of the questions that we have in the in the in the Q and A. Uh, you're on mute, Dr. Wax. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kazi, and, and thanks again, uh, Dr. Weber, for really an outstanding uh, presentation. And we still have a, a number of questions in the queue. We'll probably go for another 10 minutes max and, and wrap it up. Uh, next question uh, is about uh, um, uh, one of our uh, uh, listeners asked, uh, how a family can disinfect a bedroom in a home where a COVID-19 patient has vomited and has had diarrhea and coughed and sneezed before being hospitalized? So, well, first of all, we have no reason to believe that either the vomitus or the stool, uh, both of which may have uh, COVID RNA in them, really are infectious. Uh, but certainly uh, just their droplets uh, will have settled on places. So let's start with all, all the laundry materials, certainly uh, uh, bed sheets, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, you would like to wash, you should uh, wash them ideally with uh, some uh, Clorox or chlorine, and you should dry them uh, at, at high to remove virus on any uh, bed sheets or other material. Uh, other uh, items in the household uh, uh, could be uh, wiped down with uh, any uh, disinfectant that's listed on the CDC's uh, disinfectant webpage, so-called uh, list N, which could be diluted Clorox in the home, uh, alcohol could be used, but you have to be careful over large areas because it could be uh, flammable or other, uh, any hospital grade uh, uh, disinfectant. Ideally, you'd wear gloves and do hand hygiene before uh, and, uh, and after. I don't know, it's practical to do much. If there are floors, you could obviously mop them with the disinfectant. If it's rugs, it may not be practical and not everyone has a uh, floor or steamer there, but I think it's really the touchable areas you'd uh, uh, most uh, most uh, worry about uh, there. And I would wear gloves, uh, just wipe up vomitus and stool with paper towels uh, uh, till you get down to the floor, and then you do your disinfection, uh, wearing gloves, and then put them in a plastic bag, seal that uh, uh, before you remove your gloves. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, next question. Uh, uh, quaternary ammonium compounds are known uh, as matogens, and the rates of asthma among frontline healthcare workers are routinely higher than those for the general population. What are some safer alternatives to the use of the, uh, of the quaternary uh, compounds? So, of course, uh, quaternary, there has been some concern about quaternary ammonium compounds. We've used them for a very long period of time uh, here in the U.S., and we actually looked at how many people in our uh, uh, 15,000 employees came down to occupational health, which is free and in the building with complaints of respiratory uh, or uh, skin problems and that might be related to disinfectants and that was uh, quite, uh, quite uh, unusual there. Uh, so we believe they are safe, they are effective and they are life-saving and used in healthcare facilities. Uh, but the products uh, with the lowest uh, toxicity uh, ratios are uh, the so-called advanced, accelerated, improved hydrogen peroxide products, and uh, they can be used in the place of uh, quaternary ammonia compounds. They are, uh, in general, somewhat more expensive, but they have a, uh, they have a very low toxicity ratio. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. A couple questions about uh, the use of UV light. Uh, the first question is about the, the, any specific wavelength, and the second question is, is 15 minutes of UV light uh, adequate to kill SARS-CoV-2? So the first thing is 254 nanometers has been the uh, UVC, the wavelength most used. There are other wavelengths now that are microbiocidal that people have found, but that's the one that the most data is on as opposed to broad spectrum uh, uh, UV. It all depends on, you know, uh, the energy is uh, based on the square of the distance from the source. So the further you are away, energy falls as a square and it all depends on the intensity of the bulbs and how close they are. But the answer is yes, it's an envelope virus, and then most of the uh, devices that would be sold to a medical facility would inactivate uh, SARS-CoV-2, a uh, whole an entire room, hospital room, uh, within 15 minutes. Okay, great. Thank you. And another question um, about uh, inappropriate practice, uh, such as in inadequate dwell time or applications that, that is missing hard-to-reach areas and toxicity of compounds. Has work been done about equipment degradation uh, with environmental disinfectant procedures? So we don't really uh, see that. We actually, for instance, looked at uh, uh, how often equipment went 
down to be repaired in rooms that didn't didn't have UV light. Other people have done it. We couldn't show the UV affected it, and we haven't really been able to show in general that the disinfectants uh, damage most of the equipment. Uh, the most sensitive things are touch screens and computer screens, and uh, you do want to make sure that uh, look at the manufacturer of that to make sure that the uh, uh, device uh, that the that the chemical you put on your touch screens in particular is uh, compatible with your uh, with your device. And in terms of sterilization and those agents, you know uh, certain instruments that may be made of uh, gold or have copper or other compounds in them, uh, certain ways of sterilizing and disinfecting it may precipitate uh, some of those metals. So again, you do have to make sure that uh, uh, you have material comparability in your uh, uh, disinfectants. Great, thank you. Um, question, um, with our frequent uh, hand washing, sanitizing, and weather changes, we are seeing children with dry, small, open wounds, cracking wounds, which make hand washing, sanitizing more painful. What do you recommend we can do in schools for these children and staff to help heal their hands while continuing safe, frequent hand washings? So ideally, you would get a, a product uh, that's approved by a regulatory agency in the United States, uh, FDA uh, hand agent that has emoluments in them to help the chapping. They tend to be a little more uh, expensive, but they're better tolerated. When we bring in our hand hygiene agents, we always do field trials to see which our nurses prefer. And they usually prefer the agents that are less drying and, and, and uh, uh, there. So that's one thing is pick a specific hand hygiene agent that's less likely uh, to do that. Similarly, a mild soap as opposed to a more caustic soap. And finally, you can use uh, 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 hand uh, agents on your hand, lotions that help uh, keep it moisturized, but you do need to check and make sure the moisturizing agent and the chemical uh, that you're using on your hands are compatible. So with like chlorhexidine, uh, 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 not every chemical would be compatible, but there are uh, soft, uh, hand lotions that are compatible with it. And you just have to pick the, uh, uh, pick the right one. In addition, obviously, uh, wearing gloves when you're outside is obviously useful to help prevent uh, drying. Uh, in the winter, when you're heating houses, making sure your both the school and your house has adequate uh, humidity in the room. Uh, they often get more dried out. That's another way of helping uh, some of those issues as uh, as well. By the way, if, if if you go shop at a supermarket, uh, a lot of uh, uh, high touch areas, any benefit to wearing gloves uh, as you handle all sorts of uh, products in a market that many other people have also handled? The answer is potentially yes. Uh, uh, you have two choices, of course, if you did hand hygiene before you went into the supermarket and when you left, and in between you did not touch your mouth, nose, or eyes, that's probably okay. It's hard not to. We do that all the time. Wearing gloves is certainly an acceptable alternative, but I will say whenever you're going to wear gloves, whenever you're going to wear gloves, you must do hand hygiene before you put them on and when you take them off. Gloves are not a substitute for hand hygiene. Great. Good point. Uh, there was one listener mentioned about uh, your comment about disinfecting hospital floors and was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the rationale to disinfect floors. So Dr. Donsky has been one of the leaders in the research there, uh, showing that there is a risk of things on the floors going out from that room into other rooms uh, uh, there. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, if it's a solid floor, uh, it's, it's fairly easy to use a, some type of disinfectant on it. Again, you have to make sure it doesn't peel the floor or damage it. Uh, for uh, rugs and things like that, you can use uh, some type of uh, autom uh, large uh, steam uh, uh, disinfection system for the rugs uh, or something that has an appropriate disinfectant. What we really don't know is should we be doing it daily, a terminal cleaning, occasionally, there just hasn't been enough research to know the risk and how often we should do the disinfection for floors. So that's an area uh, still under uh, uh, constant uh, 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 research. I should say I didn't have time to talk about it, but there is a whole field of uh, either other ways of looking at persistent disinfectants that you can put on surfaces using nanotechnology, uh, uh, low-dose uh, 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 blue, so-called blue light near the UV wavelength, low-dose hydrogen peroxide in the air. So there are lots of uh, studies under looking at sort of a, uh, a continuous room or persistent room disinfection, but that would be a whole hour by itself to talk about those techniques. Thank you. I'm going to turn back to Dr. Kazi for a final couple of questions. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Weber, uh, since schools probably have a lower viral load, would just cleaning be sufficient as opposed to uh, disinfection? The answer in general is no. We always prefer a disinfectant, I think, and I actually work with uh, three of our local counties, uh, their school systems on reopening. Again, uh, mask wearing, physical distancing, and others are important. Certainly, cleaning is better than doing nothing, but cleaning is not a substitute uh, for using a disinfectant. And then uh, what about uh, uh, workplaces that use uh, hydrogen peroxide foggers? How long should they wait between two uh, patients or two uh, when, when, once they clean? Yeah. So I, I can't answer that because uh, you know, it's all device dependent uh, there. Uh, you know, uh, I will say that there are systems that you can use uh, that put out some type of fog in the room. And uh, uh, you would have to look at what the manufacturer recommends. It will depend on the size of the room, what chemicals used, uh, what the ventilation in the room is, or whether it's closed off. Uh, so I, you know, the answer is it may be, uh, and how active it is against SARS-CoV-2. It may be that as soon as it's safe to enter the room, uh, you don't have to wait any additional time. Maybe you have to wait some time, uh, but you have to look at the information on the device. And I would always say, uh, whenever using any medical device, in addition to looking at the device data itself that's produced by the manufacturer, we always like to see independent peer-reviewed research that validates that for uh, any uh, device or uh, disinfectant. You know, uh, ultrasound guided uh, procedures nowadays in the emergency department are you, you very commonly performed. And uh, you mentioned the difference between the devices. What is recommended for an ultrasound probe that is usually covered with sterile sheath and used to guide vascular access? What type of disinfection? What level? Uh, so uh, the uh, first of all, you should be using sterile gel, and it's good. It is good to have a probe cover. Uh, but the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America and most uh, uh, groups uh, recommend low-level disinfection. There have not been any outbreaks related to uh, 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 those types of probes. Endocavity probes that go into the vagina, rectum, esophagus; those need to be high-level disinfected. Very good. Uh, there are tons of more questions, but we'll probably have to spend another hour out of respect of our, our listeners. We'll probably try to tackle those separately with your, with your help, Dr. Weber. Uh, with that, I want to thank you and turn it back over to Dr. Wax. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kazi, again, and particularly many thanks to Dr. Weber for really an outstanding presentation. Uh, if we could just go to the next slide. Uh, so just a, a mention about some upcoming webinars, to, uh, another really uh, very important webinar next Wednesday at the same time, 3 p.m. on pregnancy during COVID-19. We have D Dr. Uh, Denise Jamison, who's chair of the Department of OBGYN at Emory Healthcare, will be pr presenting on this very timely uh, subject. And then uh, after taking a short break uh, over the holidays, uh, another really important and timely uh, presentation uh, uh, January 6th uh, on vaccine distribution. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have uh, Dr. Uh, Satish uh, Piley, uh, who's the medical officer of the Division of Preparedness and Emerging Infections at CDC, and I'll be giving this uh, most uh, timely uh, uh, presentation. Uh, another word, uh, this is the first in a, a series of, of webinars uh, on disinfectants. Uh, we'll probably have the, our next one sometime in February and continue this uh, disinfectant mini series uh, over, over the next uh, uh, six to eight months or so. Uh, next slide. Uh, further information about uh, our webinar series, both past webinars as well as uh, uh, upcoming webinars uh, is on our website. And you can see the uh, email, uh, the uh, webinar uh, address um, on the slide. Uh, next slide. And I'd like to again, thank uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, and the PACU program uh, for their support for this uh, webinar today. And uh, the support, of course, from the Agency of Disease Substances, uh, Toxic Registry of Disease Substances of uh, ATSDR. Uh, again, um, a very important uh, uh, effort here. And uh, hopefully people uh, learned uh, uh, a lot today. There was a tremendous amount of information. Uh, this webinar will be posted onto our website within two days, including uh, a, 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 uh, the slide set as well for your uh, perusal. And you'll get an email uh, to that effect on Friday. Uh, thanks again to our uh, speaker and moderator. Uh, everyone, please have a, a good day and stay safe. <laughs>